Thanks for joining us today on Around the Peninsula. I'm Maria Sorreo. We're talking about autism, which affects about one in 88 children, and our next guest knows all about that. Doug Baker, thanks so much for being with us today. We really appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. You know, autism is a wide spectrum, and I think that we hear the word and we don't really understand what it means. I know that your son is autistic. Mm -hmm. um, you've lived with us for a very long time, so um, we wanted to have you in to talk about that. Um, you also have gone one step further by helping other families deal with the situation. So tell us your story first um, and how you sort of got involved in, in learning more about it. Well, I'm a parent, okay. and I have uh, my son is now 22. Okay, he's my six foot four, 11 year old. I call him. Okay, <laughs> he's very innocent, and he's he's actually a wonderful kid. Uh, I also have a 20 year old daughter mm -hmm. that really pushed my son in the early years along, and uh, right now he seems to be a lot more easier to raise than she is. <laughs> are you but, saying that girls are harder? <laughs> well, at this point, yeah, you know, she can be, but she's doing a great job. I'm proud of her. She's moved That's out uh, uh, on her own and. She's going to, to junior college and working full time. Now, how old was your son when you discovered that he was autistic and to what degree? Well, the discovery was really diagnosed when he was about 21 months uh, okay. old and it was done by a group in San Diego. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the uh, top researchers was very young and part of this group uh, and now he's uh, world renowned, uh, Eric Corshain. Mm -hmm. uh, and we really noticed um, a change in him at about 13 months and it was very shortly after his MMRs or the mumps, measles, rubella, mm. uh, uh, the vaccinations. That might be coincidental. Uh, he was, you know, there's, he's not, he wasn't under, undersized at birth. He was okay. nine pounds, 11 ounces. That's a pretty good size. Um, he was always in the, you know, the, the, the top you know, uh, 95 percentile of, uh, of the ratings. Uh, but it just, all of a sudden he was talking, he, he started walking at eight months, he started talking at 11 months. And then he shut down. Um, in, in, 13 in, what months. in what way? Well, it shut down. You lost the eye contact. You had the the words all went away. Okay. Um, and then he didn't really resume talking until he was about almost five years old. So uh, uh, when he was diagnosed at 21 months, he was initially diagnosed as what they called PDD. Okay. That's pervasive developmental disorder. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of people know that as PDD NOS, not otherwise specified. So PDD NOS but it's considered on this autism spectrum, on the very high end of the autism spectrum being high functioning. Okay. Um, and that, you know, 1992, we didn't have an internet to research stuff on. Uh, and I was gonna mention that as well because it was it was like almost 20 years ago, around 20 years ago. Yeah, about 20 years ago. I'm yeah. sure that the, thing, the, the information that we have now was much, much different. What, what did you and your wife sort of, where did you go mentally thinking, okay, we have a child now that is, is gonna have some kind of an issue. How did you kind of come to deal with that? Well, the diagnosis can be devastating. Right. Um, it almost feels still like it's yesterday. The doctor looked at us and told us what the diagnosis was. He says, well, the good point is that he's PDD, so he's up on the high end. 80% um, of the kids we see coming in here have mental retardation. Your son doesn't have that. Okay. Um, so he says uh, the, the forecast for your son could be very, very good. And... Um, but the information was very scattered. Three in 10,000 was, was the number back then. Wow. Um, but then at the same time, the, the children's mother was seven months pregnant with my daughter. And what had happened was we were told that it was 25 times greater to have the same or worse conditions in your next child. So when you started doing the math on three in 10,000, mm. uh, that was concerning mm. uh, to say the least. So it was hard to find really good information at the time. Right. Um, and the services were very thin, so you couldn't, like I said, we didn't have an internet to look on to find what we have in the resources today. Was your son able to go to regular school, or, or how did that, did he go to kindergarten, first grade, or? He had some preschool work. No, he didn't, he was never really mainstream because he was pretty, he would act out, and he had, um, some of those you know, difficult issues of meltdowns and so forth. Okay. So he was in, for the most part, special day classes. We didn't understand the the individual education plan or the IEP process back then, and right. it was it was very vague. Um, and the beauty today is there's so much information and so many specialists of advocates that uh, the services and the and the things that people get for their kids today are far and above much greater than what was available back then. What are parents' biggest concerns for an autistic child? Um, I'm sure they change over the years, but what, were you, what would you say your, your biggest concerns were then and that it, as he grew up? It's different ages and stages. Mm -hmm. uh, that's kind of one of those uh, uh, 
changing medians. Right. Um, children are, when they're young, you want to get as many services as you can mm -hmm. and try to get understanding of what you're dealing with. So you're looking for services, you're looking for resources, and you're looking for support. Mm -hmm. um, as they start going through the school system, now you're trying to get the most in, out of their education. Right. You're trying to get the most behavior and you're trying to get the most, uh, I guess you want to break as many routines as possible because children with autism tend to have a very strong set of routines. Everything seems to be clockwork. Um, Which is h helpful, is that right? It, it can be helpful. The, okay. the, the, it's kind of a, it can be regimentation, which can be good, but mm -hmm. it can also, you as a parent, in fact, one of the articles I, I plan to write here soon is about breaking the, the, that, that routine because you can become a product of the routine of your child. Okay. Um, so the parents go through different stages in the different ages of their child. Uh, you know, we all go to kindergarten. Doesn't mm -hmm. matter if your child has autism or not. Right. We all go through puberty. Doesn't matter if you have autism <laughs> exactly. or not. Exactly. We all become adults at 18. Doesn't matter if you have autism. It doesn't, and it's not just autism, right. but it's all the special needs uh, of course. and so forth. So it, it, it can be just a, um, it can be a series of different concerns and needs. It, it, deep down, it really comes down to, gee, when I'm gone, who's going to take care of my child like I do? And, and let me ask you, from a parent standpoint, when did you re really realize that was going to be important? When do you think about that? Well, um, okay, then now you're getting in the difference of the sexes. <laughs> I'm a guy. We want to solve things. We Immediately. Wanna, yeah, yeah. We want to solve things. We, wanna, we were looking for answers, and we don't want to um, admit to the weaknesses. Okay. So... I was probably in denial for longer than I should have been. Uh, whereas the mothers tend to roll up their sleeves and go after it right. and get services and so forth. Uh, and if you've ever heard uh, Rodney Pete speak mm. about his experience with his son and the difference between him and his wife, he gives an outstanding just uh, dissertation of the young years and, and how proud he was. And, you know, it's just, it, it comes to a point where you have to learn acceptance. Mm -hmm, right. Um, my acceptance, you know, probably came in, the, you know, in, his, in his late adolescence, mm -hmm. uh, and then my realization that I had to really think about the long term came when my son was just about ready to leave high school. Wow! So autism is kind of interesting. Autism and mental illness kind of go hand in hand. They they tend to come on us in a surprise, mm -hmm. right? And we always have in the back of our head that it'll go away in a surprise. Mm -hmm. So when people start aging and all of a sudden the kids are full grown. Like I said, my son it was six foot two at 15 years old. Right. Um, all of a sudden now they're an adult in an adult body with a, with a young person's mind. Right. So it, uh, we all kind of reach it differently and that's, that's one of the concerns is, is a lot of the families of mental illness and autism don't think about this enough in the early stages and then all of a sudden they're later in life and they could have done a lot of things that help for their future picture, for their financial picture in the future, and so forth. Who was the biggest help to you and your family back 20 years ago? You know, realistically, the biggest help for my son mm -hmm. was his sister. Mm, interesting. Um, we had, I had my, my, my father, uh, I had my mother-in-law. They were always very, really good in supporting. But when I think of all the services, and we didn't have ABA back then. ABA was still experimental. It was just not being approved yet. It was which what is ABA? ABA is a, a Applied Behavior Analysis. Okay. And it was developed by uh, UCLA, uh, Ivor Lavas, uh, Ed Ritvo. Those people uh, developed in mm -hmm. UCLA and were uh, doing work on it in the 70s and 80s. So it was offered mm -hmm. 40 hours a week, uh, about 4,500 dollars a month back in early 90s very expensive, twice my mortgage. And mortgage, wow. that was an expensive mortgage at the time. So that was, you know, we did what we could. Mm -hmm, but, right. you know, you can, only, you can only take so much blood out of a turnip and then all of a sudden, and it, it basically was one of the processes to help kill, you know, the, the marriage mm -hmm. uh, at the, when my son was about seven or eight. So what was your daughter able to do that maybe other people weren't? My son was able to have this recognition. It was kind of funny to watch the the dynamics. Mm. He knew he was older. Uh, my daughter was doing things and he would see her doing things and he's thinking, well, I'm older and I should be doing that too. Mm. They were very close when they were young and they, they were always looking out for each other, mm -hmm. but he wasn't you know, quite as aware of the responsibility where my daughter was. Um, of all the therapies, and we did a lot of intervention early and it's made him a really good kid right now, but 
Will he ever drive? Well, you know, any of that kind of stuff. Uh, he didn't graduate from high school. He certificated out. Uh, he, he, it was probably the influence of her was what brought him along as far as, as he's gotten today. And I think he could even go further with the right type of, you know, programs, adult programs, and even potentially getting him into an education program. And I was going to ask you about that. If autistic children can be taught to take care of themselves, or is, again, is it the spectrum? It is the spectrum. Okay. Uh, my son is, you know, I used to always think my son was high functioning. Mm -hmm. And then I meet these high functioning kids that speak four languages. They play, you know, a classical uh, uh, a virtuoso instrument. And uh, they graduate from high school. Mm -hmm. um, and so then I kind of say, okay, well, maybe my son's moderate, you know, to, to mild. Uh, well, everybody's so different, like you said. It is. You don't it, know. It, it, it's, it, it, the spectrum is kind of like a thermometer. Mm -hmm. You can be really hot and good, and you can be really, really cool. And there's so many degrees um, that there's, you know, once you've met one autis autistic child, you've met one autistic child because exactly it can be it, it can be a different process in regard to two kids that seem identical, have the same diagnosis, have the same age, same, and yet the methods that work on one may not work at all on the other. And you know, and you've learned over the years how important it is to plan for the future. And we talk about that, you know, the, the, the different levels of diversity. What kind of advice do you give parents that have autistic children? How do you sort of assess where their children are to plan for the future? It, uh, well, again, it can depend on where the parents are and on the spectrum. Okay. The younger the parents are, the better the opportunity is for them to plan something long term. Right. Just like when your child's born. Right, exactly. You, you want to set up a college plan so that at 18 you've got hopefully some money put aside in college. Mm -hmm. um, parents with special needs kids often don't do that. Right. And they, yet they can use all those years and double those years and triple those years uh, to save for second generation funding mm -hmm. and that's the survivorship of your special needs child and protection once we're no longer here to take care of them. Look, uh, you can never find somebody that's going to love and take care of your child exactly the way you do. Any child, that's, any, that's, you know, right. it doesn't so, matter, yes. So the, the, the beauty is that uh, if you use time to your advantage, mm -hmm. you can have something nicely put aside where your child can be taken care of by either another family member, a trusted you know, uh, a fiduciary or advisor, right. a relative, or even professionals that mm -hmm. can do that. And um, you know, that's, that's important looking out long term for these kids. I know in the situation of Jim and Kathy Gott, who we talked about, and Jim used to play for the Dodgers, and he brings Danny out to Dodger games all the time, and, and all of his children. And he's got Danny's farm set up, and mm -hmm. Danny can actually work there, he can participate. And that was really Jim's dream, is that he'll be able to function growing into adulthood, being able to work and to do some things. So I think that that's got to be the thought of every parent with an autistic child of wh what will happen next, if they can work, if they can do, what they can do. Yeah, and we're in kind of a, a interesting set of times right now. The world has changed. The, the markets have changed. Uh, we've gone through the worst financial crisis that we've dealt with in our lifetime. And I don't think we're going to see another one like what happened in 2008, 2009. Let's hope not. Well, uh, so, so the, the thought is that we have a lot of now kids that are starting to go into adulthood, and a lot of these organizations are talking about jobs for these kids and whatever. Mm -hmm. And I often stand up and say, you know, with the amount of unemployment we have at adult level for regular <laughs> yeah, adults, you're right. it's almost more important for these parents of these kids to have jobs so they can support their kids. Because, yes. Because you know, the idea of when you're trying to financially take care of your family, mm -hmm. there's, there's, in the special needs world, there's really three tracks. The first okay. track is the parents need to take care of themselves. If they don't take care of themselves, they, they're no good to their family or their special needs child. Then they need to plan really for their family, mm -hmm. and then they need to plan for their special needs child. That third track, that special needs plan, is a set of wheels moving that very few people across the United States really understand the lifespan of services, issues, and management that it's going to take to manage these kids, and that's what I specialize in. And I've, I've kind of taken a process and wrapped it around that financial and wealth management services because I couldn't find it for my son when I was doing this about four years ago. Exactly. So I said, here's a perfect opportunity to give back to the community because we're the ones that are giving back to it. You know, it's, it's interesting to me because I know that private funding is so low, and we were talking about the numbers. Uh, pediatric AIDS affects 1 in 300, funding around 394 million. Mm -hmm. Juvenile diabetes affects 1 in 500, funding 156 million. 
autism, one in 88, and it's about $79 million. Why is that? Is it just because we don't know enough about it? What is, why it affects more and less money comes through? There's a couple dynamics that work in there, and, and I've tried to figure it all out too. I don't have the, all the answers, but what I see is there's, there's a few things. Number okay. one is acceptance inside the community. Mm -hmm. There are, um, autism is kind of known, in fact, some recent studies have come out with older fathers have okay. been tied to, well, you know, that wasn't me, I was in my early 30s. Um, you know, it was, he wasn't uh, underweight, so th that kind of deal. Right. But what happens is, is you get a lot of families that have an issue with acceptance mm -hmm. and wanting to accept that there's something wrong with their child right. and then not wanting to be part of the community that they're really actually part of. Very true. So that's the first part. You've got that. And, and you do have many families that have more financial means uh, and even excessive financial means. Sure. That, you know, I mean, uh, what was it, Tommy Hilfiger? Mm -hmm, right. And then he just come out, yes. and all these years he's kind of kept that out of the public light. Right. Um, I mean, think about what he could have done for the community 20 years ago, starting in this. That's the thing. It's so important, I think, to to tell your story, to talk about it, so that more mm -hmm. people are aware of it, so that things like the funding will get bigger and more helpful. Well, and then you go to the other side is they say that autism has never killed anybody. Right. Um, it, because AIDS, people die, uh, diabetes, people die, and so forth. Um, well, when we talk about autism, we can also talk about there's a lot of deaths that go on. There's death of the dreams, right. there's death, death of what, you're, you know, what you planned, and the, the white pick fence and all that stuff kind of, you know, a lot of us are trying to re rebuild our dreams. Um, there's the death of many marriages. It's almost an 80% divorce rate. Um, there's, you know, the, the, the death of, of other what I call relationships in the family. The, a lot of studies are coming out now in regard to how autism affects the entire family, mm -hmm. not only the immediate siblings, but it can ripple into the uh, uh, other family members and siblings of the parents. So um, that's, it, it, it is concerning. And the numbers at 1 in 88 might still be too high. They could, really? actually, I, 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 they could be lower. I think there, there was a big study done last year in Korea. It was a large study. It was either 60 or 90,000 people. And they came up with about one in thirty-eight. Oh, that's much lower. So it's a, so when you when you're starting to get a to a tighter number, you've got uh, you know what fifty-four million Americans right with a physical or mental disability. Some or some in, part of the spectrum. In yes. The, well, mm -hmm. in the United States, I'm right. talking about just pure you know disabilities. It's yeah. not just autism. Sure. Um, but there's also uh, the same Reuters article was citing that uh, in six percent of the kids from five to fifteen suffer from some sort of disability. So now you've got six in 100 instead of one in 88, and that's all disabilities. Um, so a lot of different things that we're dealing with living that we have to continue to deal with. I know there are a lot of resources. There's much more information. Talk about some of those before we wrap up so that we can help other people to know what's out there to help. Well, there, there's, you know, there's always the associations, uh, Autism Society, there's, I mean, there's a variety of, there's Generation, Jenny McCarthy's Generation Rescue. Yes. You have Lisa Ackerman's uh, Talk About Curing Autism, or TACA. Mm -hmm. um, you have Autism Speaks, which is kind of the 800-pound the gorilla out there. Um, they all have different agendas. They mm -hmm. all have different type of beliefs, uh, which in some ways kind of hurts the, the United Voice, but in other ways it's raised a tremendous amount of aware, uh, awareness. Mm -hmm. You have parent groups. Uh, in fact, right now I'm part of a, a South Bay group, the Autism Society of, of LA in the meeting here in the South Bay, where the group has been put together by parents with kids just about turning adults. Great. So 17, 18, 19, 20, 21 year olds, because this is kind of getting to the age where the parents, now they wake up and they say, geez, um, my what kid's an adult. Right, what do we do now? Yeah, what are, where, you know, and at 22 they leave the school system and they're back at a regional center, which I call it the, the Regional Center Fiscal Services Cliff because there's very little out there after 22. Do you find that you've learned more from talking to other parents and being together? Absolutely. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm probably in five to, to seven different association meetings wow. every month. Uh, conference, you know, the conferences, I'm, I, I do speaking presentations, but I'm a parent. Right. And first and first foremost, and foremost, I'm yes. trying to learn yeah. because what I learn is is I can help other families and, and pass that on. So resources often can be siloed mm -hmm, right. and parents have trouble finding them all out. What I've tried to do is build my practice around 
being a resource, Great. Uh, kind of being that life coach, almost like the quarterback, mm -hmm. to where we can help them through their life um, and help them through the changes of legislation, service changes, resources, and then collaborating with all the experts, you know, the, the, the accountants and the lawyers and you know, everyone else that they're going to need in their life to help them support you know, adult services for when their child gets older. And if someone wanted to reach you, what is your information website? Well, I, I've got, uh, um, I'm available on uh, uh, LinkedIn, okay. uh, Douglas Baker. Uh, you can actually probably Google me or Bing me <laughs> at uh, Douglas Baker. There's so many yeah, forms Douglas of social Baker, media now. You know, special needs, uh, <laughs> you know, that brings a lot of information up. I have a Facebook Great. page, uh, Special Needs Advisor, okay. on my Facebook page. And, uh, you know, the financial services firm I work for, I'm right here in Torrance. Uh, you'll find, like I said, uh, just Google me or Bing okay. me under uh, Douglas Baker Special Needs and you'll find me fairly easily. Great. Douglas, thank you so much for being with us, sharing some of your um, valuable information on autism. We'll look forward to talking to you again. Thank you. Thanks so much for watching. I'm Maria Sorreo, and we'll see you next time around the peninsula.